afternoon, good morning for those tuning in elsewhere. Welcome to Getting to Quick Wins Across the Enterprise with Responsible AI. My name is Katherine Papandrew. I am an AI ML global black belt at Microsoft. So that is a really cheesy term for we work with a lot of customers building out mature AI platforms and using Azure services to underpin that journey. And I'm so pleased today to be joined by Kindrel, who will be showing some of their takeaways, some of their offerings in their journey for getting to quick wins with generative AI at enterprise scale. That's sort of the key component there. Um, and so for that, I'd like to introduce Ron Xavier. He's the Director of Digital Workplace Services at Kindrel. Goldie Alosius, the Director of Data Architecture for Kindrel, and Jerry Lack, the Director of the Microsoft Alliance Business Development at Kindrel. And they're going to kind of go through, peel back the layers of the onion on user-centric, tooling-centric, and then kind of governance model all up for enterprise. So with that, I'm going to introduce Ron, who will talk first about leveraging Gen AI to build new experiences for your customers and employees. Thanks, Ron. Thank you very much. Oh, there you go. Good day, everybody. There's a lot to talk about, so let's squeeze as much information as possible into the time we have. So I want to start with the human aspect of this. It's pivotal to include humans in AI development, both from a development aspect, but from an outcome aspect. We have to understand that the human focus is focusing on humans' needs and behaviors. McKinsey reported that a human-centric approach is crucial in 70% of AI-integrated companies. Deloitte shows a study that has customer satisfaction increasing by 75% for human-centric AI projects. So it's very key to prioritize and lead to meaningful, effective, and impactful AI solutions. But along those lines, we end up with common concerns about AI. And these concerns have ranged from, you know, we're not going to implement AI, we're, we're too scared, this is like the infancy of the internet, to, hey, let's go all in. So some of these common concerns include ROI concerns. You know, only a PwC survey showed that about 25% of companies have achieved significant ROI. That's really tied to high, highlighting realistic goals. What are you trying to achieve in the end? Are you trying to automate your entire company? Well, that may not happen at this point in time. So you have to look for those smaller, again, quick wins to be able to move you along that journey. There's prompting and AI literacy. Most of us, and I know me specifically, have worked with people in the company where prompting has been a bit of a disaster. Understanding that it's not keyword searching, it's actually communicating with something that's gonna communicate back. And there's multiple ways of achieving this, starting with you know, a broad prompt and refining to get to your end goal, or you may be more of a mature prompter that understands the structure of a prompt and you start out with a very large prompt that gets you to your end goal very quickly. Then there's the cost of implementation. The cost of implementation is a lot of the time to do with starting with the far end, which would be an IaaS implementation of AI, which is your most expensive way of looking at it, instead of starting with maybe a SaaS solution and seeing if that satisfies the need. And as you start with that SaaS solution, do you now start integrating some of the PaaS components to enhance those capabilities and use cases to make it apply to a broader audience? And then on the far, far end, if you're looking at investments for something custom, then you may end up with that IaaS solution. And this leads into really the generative AI versus enterprise AI discussion. And a lot of this is now, you might consider enterprise AI as traditional AI, but it's really a focus. With the generative AI aspect of it in the generating content, text, images, and based on learning and data. So Gartner predicts that about 10% of all data produced will be from generative AI in 2025, and that's up from 1% in 2022. Now, that's a lot to do with potential innovation. To have somebody that you can interact with as you vet ideas, as you look at data and try to find insights, as you look at ways to improve processes, you have this back and forth communication that helps you along that innovation process. But there is also obviously the challenges that are ethical as well as responsible use-based. But then you have the enterprise AI aspect of it, which is really driving towards those process automation um, enhancements, enhancing analytics, and improving decision making. And that's where the larger opportunity is to apply some of these in an enterprise way. And IDC reports that enterprise-based projects using enterprise AI are focusing on enterprise AI outcomes 
is going to grow to $97.9 billion in investments in 2023. That's more than double of what was in 2019. So this distinction really matters because you're looking at the creative side of things with generative AI and being able to provide those insights as you need them without having to question something. So it's sort of the next best action is presented to you through an enterprise AI implementation. And how we do this at Kindrel is really looking at enterprise management as a service. We've created a framework that doesn't apply just to the services that we provide for, say, digital workplace services or data apps and AI or cloud, but it's a framework that can be used all across. And it's also designed to, in a way that AI can be used on AI-based solutions. So I'll give you an example. Imagine we roll out a, a Power Virtual Agent and people are submitting questions to that Power Virtual Agent. We can now look at those questions and analyze the questions with AI to determine maybe some of these should be an enterprise AI solution. These should be put in a dashboard because this is information that's constantly being requested by a large portion of the business. So we should convert this into a dashboard, convert this into some sort of adaptive card that can be presented to a user instead of the consistent prompts over and over again for the same information. So it's moving it from one area to another. And how we look at this is sort of a four-step process. We have journey mapping, which analyzes the end-to-end -end journey of a service, but also of the experience of an end user, identifying those key touch points and uh, identifying the moments of the user experience. We look at XLA design, the experience level agreements, and understanding how that aligns with business goals and user needs. And we focus on satisfaction, loyalty, productivity, and innovation. And then how we measure these. So being able to measure these with a unified platform for data collection and be able to use various sources to ensure a comprehensive monitoring service experience. And finally, the experience improvement. As we roll out these solutions, especially in these early days, there's going to be iteration. There is going to be improvement. So we need to have the data to be able to determine what is meaningful change. How do we prioritize action to enhance efficiency? How do we prioritize strategic changes for automation and AI? So I want to look at it from a leading with experience for quick wins. And these are six quick things you could look at. And these apply to Microsoft 365 Copilot. Obviously, you see Power Virtual Agents, which was kind of blown up yesterday for many of you that have <laughs> saw the keynote, which is now you know, standalone co-pilots. And then the Azure AI services and everything that leads into Azure ML and the infrastructure as a service piece. Understanding the user needs and context is extremely, extremely important. We need to tailor these solutions to enhance productivity and creation, or we need to look at the stress, we need to stress understanding of queries and context based on how they're interacting with this. So from a co-pilot aspect, it's now productivity and document creation and meeting summaries and enhancements. But then from a power virtual agent, it may be understanding customer queries and providing relevant and personalized responses. And then if you go to that far end now in the Azure AI services, this is more so the industry specific requirements where it could be for a specific manufacturing company or a retail environment. We look at identifying opportunities for AI integration. This is you know, scheduling, uh, being able to manage your day better, being able to even provide you with more time to do other things, to be able to provide enhanced well-being because you're not spending so much time on these mundane tasks, to provide time for you to take on additional learning for career improvement and enhancement. We're looking at automating customer service interactions, reducing response times, and then again, enterprise level changes. We need to be able to scale this to an enterprise. We need to be able to look at predictive analytics and maybe even IoT configurations. Enhancing user engagement comes down to adoption, but also in the solution itself, many of us have hopefully that have had access to Copilot have seen the inline suggestions that you get when you're looking to prompt, or inline suggestions that you have in Teams for responses. That helps engagement with using the necessary tool. So we need to look at being able to in, ingrain engagement, ingrain adoption, ingrain a change of behaviors to be able to enhance that user engagement. Streamlining processes, this is around the workflow orchestration of the business. How do we now take these processes that have these multiple touch points, multiple teams involved, and streamline that so it's now a single touch point, or we're predicting the next step in that process. If I have a broken device, if I have uh, some data I'm looking to analyze, what are the common things that I'm looking at based on my behaviors? What are the common insights that I've asked when I've looked at this data before? How can it streamline that process for me to get to my end result faster? Then we have to measure impact and success. 
And for most of us, depending on how far you are up the food chain, this is a difficult conversation. A lot of what we're doing right now in AI is soft costs, is the time. How do we save time? How do we quantify productivity? But how does this get to the revenue generating side? And when it comes to now streamlining processes and that enterprise AI aspect of the conversation, the enterprise AI aspect a lot of the time leads to that revenue conversation, while the generative AI aspect is more of the soft cost and the productivity. So that's why I touched upon moving some of those generative AI situations, cases, to the enterprise AI side of the house to be able to attribute that to revenue. And then finally, creating a feedback loop. As we iterate and we create these solutions, there is constant improvement. There is constant analytics we need to have, constant monitoring we need to have, both from a cost aspect, but from the business goals aspect, to determine that we are implementing a solution that is getting us further along, that is bringing us forward as a business, bringing individuals forward, bringing departments forward, and driving the business forward in general. Thank you very much, Kit, back to you. So yes, give him a hand, give him a hand. So with all the announcements the last two days, with what you just heard from Ron, I know a common question I get from customers is, there's this giant ecosystem all the way down from SaaS down to PaaS to IaaS and everything in between. How do I decide what's the right approach for my organization? And even myself being inundated with this every day, I also tend to see where do I get a map <laughs> to be able to decide and have a decision tree. Um, and so the expertise that he's talking about is super rare and very important to be able to discern what the right approach is so that your end user is getting the value of generative AI, but it's a pragmatic approach for your organization. Um, and as you're thinking through questions around that, just like I had things mulling in my own head, I forgot to mention at the beginning, be sure to see the QR code here on the side, which will go to Pubble. It's our Q&A platform. Towards the end of the session, we'll be going through Q&A, and we have um, some excellent moderators that are going to be also answering questions on the chat itself. And so be sure to go in there, start adding questions as things come up uh, in your mind throughout the rest of the session, and we'll address those at the end. Um, so now you've heard about customer experience, you've heard about the end user value, the enterprise value around streamlining, getting measurable ways to um, quantify or qualify that impact, but how do you actually control it? How do you have tools and processes buffering around the services so that you can have everything from development all the way through production and scaling beyond observable, maintainable, and secure? And for that, I'm going to pass it to Goldie to talk a little bit about LLM Ops and what Kindrel's experience has been in that space. Goldie. <laughs> Thank you, Kit. So good day, everyone. So what I want to talk to you, like Kit mentioned, is about how do you get your enterprises generative AI ready, right? It's not just about starting with a POC or a pilot, but how can you actually take that into production? So when Microsoft released Azure OpenAI earlier this year, we started evaluating the service and we were looking at how do we take this beyond just a POC or a pilot into a enterprise ready service that can be consumed by the business users, right? So as part of that, we quickly realized that it needs to be an end-to-end -end service and that is when the industry has been talking about this concept of LLM ops. So we started working on what would LLM ops from Kindrel be for our customers, right? And just to level set with everyone, what do we mean by LLM ops? I've just given a definition there so that you can just refer to that. And then what you see on the right side is why LLM ops, right? So over here, uh, the first point is about customers need an ability to look at their data to understand is it suitable for their AI or generative AI solutions. We all understand data is fundamental or of paramount importance to any analytics, machine learning, AI, generative AI solutions, right? So how do you ensure that your data is available and it's suitable, you're not sharing any confidential information, et cetera, into your large language models? The second aspect is around model selection and fine tuning, right? So in model selections, we, for those of us who have been actually playing around with large language models, we understand that 
use cases need not mean it's not a one-to-one -one mapping where for one use case you need just one large language model. You may need multiple large language models depending on the features you want to provide to your end users, right? Like do you want a multi-language support? Do you want embedding? So different types of, I would say, solution building blocks bring in multiple models into your solution. And then, now once you have your model selected, how do you ground your models so that you get the contextual information for your enterprise? So the second aspect around model selection and fine tuning is very important. The third aspect is around prompt engineering. So we understand that the optimal prompts gives us the best results. So how do we test, develop, optimal prompts and make them available in a prompt library so that the end users can consume it in a safe manner, which is in compliance with your information security policies and at the same time is cost effective. The fourth aspect is around large language model deployment, right? The models themselves or the solutions that you're building which would be supporting large language models, right? So over here, there are different deployment models based on your enterprise architecture, your organizational information security policies, et cetera, that can derive what is needed for large language model deployments. So that is an important aspect to consider. And last but not the least is, when you take any service into production, it needs to be monitored and maintained. So how do you ensure that there is no data drifts, there is how are you controlling hallucination, how are you detecting ha hallucination, how are you detecting bias? So all these aspects need to be constantly monitored for any of your solutions. So this is where, when we considered all these points, we started building our LLMOps service. And you would see at the bottom, our LLMOps service has five key pillars. They are on prompt management, observability, orchestration, security and privacy, and FinOps. So I have briefly touched upon prompt management, observability, but let me just also touch upon orchestration, right? So now over here, once you have the, you know, for your model grounding, you need your enterprise data. So how do you ensure that that data, the pipelines are being monitored, are being set up, are, you know, you can actually reuse them? How do you ensure that your user feedback is being captured on the model effectiveness? And all of these aspects are part of the orchestration function. We want to look at the security and privacy where we want to actually ensure that the information going in is actually in line with your organizational policy. So we refer to it as policy packs where we can look at whether is it domain specific, is it your region specific, or even your enterprise specific. Right? So we can define such policy packs so that your prompt filtering can be done based on that, your toxic keyword checks, et cetera, all these different security and privacy functions can be uh, considered. And then last but not the least is the FinOps part, right? So when you normally deploy a service into production, you obviously have a budget you have planned for this service. So how do you ensure that you're staying within your budget? How do you know who is consuming that budget? All these various aspects, it would be good to have that view upfront rather than having that as an afterthought. So these are the various aspects or pillars of our solution that we have considered. And by this solution or service, what we want to actually provide our customers is an ability to rapidly build and deploy large language model solution use cases and applications. How do you automate the operation, optimize the performance while keeping it secure? So this is a logical view of the LLMOps service, how we would offer to our customers. So you have all the features that I've mentioned there right on top. And how this is being offered is through a unified console. And you would see that on the left and right, there are two boxes there. So some of these features are helpful as part of your development, and some of them are part of your deployment aspects, right? And all this is in the backend talking to services from Microsoft like Azure Open AI Service and the other services along with open source models. So this is the logical architecture, if I can call it, or a solution blueprint of our service. Now, how do we bring this to our customers? So this is where we actually start with a consulting-led approach where we have our consultants who can work with you to identify your use cases, problem statements, how do you plan for your generative AI journey, and then how do you design those steps or your MVPs, right? 
And once you have that, how do we implement it from a build, deploy, and operationalize perspective? And once that is done, how do we help you with steady state support? So we can help our customers in this entire journey, but again, it's I don't want to convey the impression that it has to be end-to-end. -end. You can only come to us if it's an end-to-end -end engagement. We can meet you wherever you are. So in case you have already identified the use cases that are specific to your industry, we can definitely come and help you with the implementation part of it. We can partner with you on that. We can partner with you if you already have it implemented on a POC or a pilot, but you want to scale it out into a production deployment. We can partner with you there that, at that stage too. And the last one is if you have now already completed your deployment and you want somebody to help you with managing it in production, we can partner with you there also. So that brings me to the LLM Ops part of my uh, session. Now, as the topic says, this is about how can we get some quick wins, right? So I want to talk about one of the pilots that we have done with one of our customers using Azure OpenAI. So this customer has a very active social media handle where there's a lot of feedback that comes in terms of reviews, feedback, comments every month. So they have a dedicated support team that goes through these comments and figures out how to respond to each of these social media comments that they're getting. But it's a manual and laborious task. So they reached out to Kindrel asking, how can we help them for a solution around this? So this is where our team came in and we built a solution prototype where we can actually get the social media data into Azure, actually do the data preparation around it, send the information to Azure OpenAI so that Azure OpenAI service, the models, the LLM models available can classify them into sentiment analysis and then help with drafting email responses, which can be consumed by the customer service agents. So this was completely done. And from this particular pilot that we did, we were able to offer the customer enhanced sentiment analysis using large language models. So it is no longer just about using a rule based or you know based on an individual, but we were now able to enhance that experience and make it more hyper-personalized help the agents with draft email text that they could actually use readily to respond back to the customers. And all this was done by we building a streamlit application so the users could get their social media data, feed it into it, get the output, be it, it could be a query like, you know, what are maybe something like a parking charge per hour sort of a question. So all these were information that we bought in from their FAQ documents. So that means these type of queries could be answered effectively and immediately back to the customers. And if there is a comment or a feedback, how do we answer them in a hyper-personalized manner through email drafts which the customer agents could use? So this brings me to the end of my session, um, uh, my content over here. So we also have a follow-on session an hour from now where I would be diving a bit more deeper into LLM Ops and also this particular use case. So if you have any questions, we can discuss it here at the end of the session or feel free to join us for our next session to understand more. Thank you and over to you, Kit. Thank you, Goldie. All right, so now you've got a, a visual on the LLM ops and all of the components of that to build out tooling, processes, have some gates, some checks, some checks and balances, so that when your uh, development teams are putting forth these applications, you've got those guardrails in place. But the next logical question that I typically get from customers is, okay, we're excited about the, obviously the end user applications and the power of Gen AI. We're excited about the tooling to help us get there from a DevOps, LLM Ops perspective. But from an organizational point of view, how do we think about this strategically? How do we organize a center of excellence? How do we have a programmatic approach to deciding what our principles are, what our goals are, what responsible AI, um, tenants are that we're going to be building out of and standing firm on. And that journey is not a trivial one. Microsoft has been on this for about seven years where we've had very intentional responsible AI tenants 
published white papers, research, et cetera, that's gone into our responsible AI approach. You saw some exciting announcements today about some of that coming out through tooling as well. But organizations individually might have specific concerns because they are regulated or they have compliance restrictions. And that's where certain tailoring might be needed to help create that governance model around their, their responsible AI and the um, generative AI adoption. And so for that, I'd like to welcome Jerry to the stage to talk about the governance model that organizations have adopted and how Kindrel has helped shepherd them through that process. Jerry. Thanks, Kit. Appreciate it. Um, so Kindrel uh, has a different approach than other vendors to helping you and your organization accelerate your generative AI adoption. We've given a lot of thought to this and had a lot of conversations with our customers and I've had the privilege of speaking with many of our existing customers and all of us have one thing in common. This is very early in our adoption journey. We're all navigating this in real time and it's only been about a year since generative AI has gone mainstream, probably about October of last year and it usually takes us and, and, our, and organizations we talk to about two to three years for adopting a strategy and an implementation path for a new technology. But we're moving very fast now. Generative AI is flipping the script. All of the adoption curves we've seen are changing because of this technology and it's very disruptive. Our users, our customers are all asking for this in order to implement their workflow and, their, uh, and, and to get to their productivity gains that they're looking for in this technology. So what is stopping us from getting there? And the conversation seems to be pretty uniform. Internally, for large enterprises, a focus is on risk to the business and secure and responsible AI. And this is something that I'm going to discuss with you because we've built these five capabilities around helping you navigate security, governance, risk management, cost management, and responsible adoption of generative AI. And Microsoft does have tenets around responsible AI adoption, as do many other vendors. Um, but m some of our enterprises feel like it doesn't cover their specific needs and objectives. And it can't, right? Because every customer is different. Your organization, your public sector organization, whether you're a private organization, you will have different needs and objectives around AI and how it impacts your business. So our job is to help you get there. Our approach centers on how to help respond to these issues in a productive way to get you to quick wins and implement your use cases in line with your policies and alleviate these risks that we're seeing within generative AI because it is an early technology. There are things that we still don't know about it and there are still risks and impacts that are still coming even in the future. So one of the things that I did very early on when I was looking at how to help our customers with generative AI adoption is I asked Bing Chat, what are the risks of using generative AI? And when the tool tells you what it is, believe it the first time, right? And so one of the things, I'm not gonna go through everything it said, but the key takeaways from Bing Chat, and you can do this yourself, are concern over the content going into the models, possibly training the model, or releasing private IP into the public domain, and a need for human touch for everything it creates to check for bias and hallucination and possibly accidental misuse of the platform. And you know, Microsoft, especially with the announcements today, are doing a great job in trying to address a lot of these concerns. But again, your needs may need, may have custom aspects that we need to address directly, and you have specific objectives you want to, want to hit. Your legal teams, your security teams may have others. And let's speak a minute about the cost implications related to generative AI. And this is something that I don't think people are talking a lot about uh, uh, yet, but the ecosystem for generative AI continues to get more complex. If you fast forward six months to a year into the future, you're going to see industry-specific models being developed. You're going to see specific generative AI LLMs and SLMs coming out into the industry that, are, that have specific use cases for you to use. And the individual models from multiple vendors are getting more complex. 
and there's new features coming from Microsoft and third-party vendors that all have costs and additional costs for premium features whether it's larger prompt sizes, HD images and video, priority access to newer features or different models that they're creating that are forks off of the, pre, the, the primary model, they can all affect your budget planning and your P&L. And your users want to use these, especially if they just want to play. And the question is, how do you manage your costs if those users want to create HD images or video on their own? You know, right now they have, they could potentially have full access to all of this or they have no access to all of this. So Kindrel is here to help you control your costs, help you with your budget allocations and enforce those budgets so your AI costs don't spiral out of control. And Goldie actually spoke to some of this with the LLM Ops platform. And let's talk about sustainability. Something else that we've really had a, a finger on the pulse of talking to our customers that have sustainability objectives that they're trying to get to. Generative AI has environmental implications, whether it's the power and manufacturing costs, um, infrastructure costs of building new data centers. We've spent you know, the two and a half years of our existence <laughs> working through trying to get our customers to consolidate their infrastructures and move to a cloud ecosystem so that they can meet their sustainability goals. And now, we're racking and stacking GPUs so that we can handle large language model loads and be able to handle um, the AI needs of, of customers. So Satya has mentioned that Microsoft is going to zero carbon emissions in 2025. I think that's a step in the right direction. I think that's really great. But we also need to look at the water implications. ChatGPT, OpenAI's ChatGPT consumes 500 milliliters of water for every five to 50 prompts or questions. And that impacts sustainability in your organization that utilizes any of the open AI services. And there's additional large language models that are out there and additional vendors whose sustainability targets are actually um, slipping a little bit because of open AI investments or, or generative AI investments. So this is something that we need to be looking at. And what's the response here? How do we resolve that? Well, our approach to sustainability and generative AI helps you choose the right model for the prompts given, move large language model queries to more sustainability aligned large language models, or even smaller SLMs and private models, the right model for the right query. And being able to help your users get the prompts right the first time and avoid reprompting for the same queries. So, you know, create a session that creates an encryption key, they interact with that session, the encryption key goes away, all of that chat, chat history is gone but we're trying to keep that. And an overall view of Kindrel's service capabilities around responsible AI, and this integrates what Ron and Goldie were talking about, um, including the LLM ops capabilities and, and our end user experience capabilities. We've developed a suite of service capabilities to help you navigate your own journey for adoption of generative AI. And the idea here is to look at the entire organization not just the AI component. And if you take one thing away from my time on stage here, it's that once you start navigating the generative AI journey, you're touching every aspect of your organization, every person, every application, every system. You have to look at what does it mean to HR that your users now have access to generative AI capabilities? Are we going to have, gener are we going to have HR responses to some of the things that they may have accidentally created? What does service desk look like for you? How are you going to support the generative AI applications that are being created, your use cases, large language models? How are you going to support the calls that say, hey, I'm having trouble with this prompt, can you help me generate the right result? What do those knowledge articles look like? What is your InfoSec team going to do and how are they going to respond to the new threat vectors and threats coming from generative AI large language models? Whether it's a rogue browser plugin or a rogue LLM or possibly code injection or jailbreaking or hacking, Microsoft is moving in the right direction. A lot of the announcements that came today about jailbreaking are going to help with that. However, User endpoint protection is a whole other conversation. And as the third party LLMs come in, and as browser plugins come in, and as there's additional content coming from industry, you are going to need to have a plan. 
Securing your data estate is another very important consideration. When you are implementing things like Microsoft Copilot, when you're implementing large language models, they will look for anything the user has read access to. And that could be items that you didn't know they did have access to. And so, and some of you who are, have adopted Copilot already are nodding your heads. <laughs> so we will help you navigate your data estate, making sure that we're implementing things like Microsoft Fabric to make sure that data is marked sensitive and confidential and that your security permissions are allocated appropriately across Teams, across OneDrive, and across your, your data environment so that we can make sure that once you implement generative AI capabilities that your queries and responses reflect the policies that you are putting in place. And we are also going to be helping your users by training them to help them understand new the new company policies we've helped you create and how to use AI responsibly. And we meet you where you are, Goldie said this too. We understand your concerns and your use cases and provide the consulting and technical assistance to navigate your adoption to production as soon as possible. Part of our services capabilities is something we're working on around policy enforcement and cost management. And it's a new uh, virtual appliance that we're, we're creating. And this is similar to a firewall or a proxy or a gateway. And it sits between a persona or a custom application and the large language models. And this is customizable to you. It's an open platform. It can reside anywhere you run Kubernetes, including Azure, Azure Stack HCI, Edge, or even on-premise. It can even reside without internet access. So on, on items like cruise ships or derricks or underwater. It can be installed on your network, not on ours, on yours. Single tenant and customized to your needs. So this is fully customizable. It works with most major large language models, small language models, and private large language models from um, all of the ecosystem on the screen, including Hugging Face, Copilot, um, GitHub Copilot, and others, and other vendors as well. And it provides role-based access control. So one of the common complaints I've had from our customers is we are going to have users that can actually go in and generate code that don't know how to code. I can say, do my job for me and create this application for me in Perl. I download an open source compiler from the internet. I put that on my laptop and suddenly I've been an application developer. And you know who's gonna have to support that and secure that and maintain that application they just created with generative AI? We are. So with this tool, we can actually turn off the ability for users to generate code. We can actually look at users' needs and say they don't need to generate uh, images. They don't need to generate video. This, this could potentially not meet our marketing or branding or internal standards for creation. So we can actually say you get text with this specific model and that's it. And if we want to change the models on the back end, we can. And so um, the other items that are, on, that are in this capability include policy packs and compliance enforcement. We have a number of compliant businesses that we work with and public sector agencies, and they're worried about HIPAA and high trust and GDPR and other industry compliance like FDA and even internationally. And so we implemented something called policy packs, which is a standard or customizable uh, filter within the tool that allows us to set rules on what is your IP, what is your trade secret, what do you want to go into the model, and what do you want to prevent from going in the model, and what results do you want to have come back to the user or not. And we can actually set threat rankings on those individual uh, policy packs so that we can set those and flag those for manual review automated review, we can block or we can, we can allow those through. We, have, we provide a bias and hallucination mitigation by querying multiple models and reconciling that data and throwing out the outlier content so we can say that you know, this model hallucinated so we're gonna use this data instead. We can do code reconciliation by taking code from multiple models and reconciling that to a single clean code base. 
and we offer automated and manual quarantining as part of this capability. So this provides you human in the loop when it comes to generative AI. If you have a need to flag the queries and responses going through your organization, we can actually set these to quarantine and have a manual process where your users or where your administrators have the ability to say, I accept this to be released to the user, and then the user's notified to retrieve that, that image or that video or that code or that content. Or we can say, you know, reject, and they're notified that it was rejected, or we can say accept. We're watermarking text, image, video, code, and music so that you know what prompt was used to generate that that it was generated to begin with, who did it, what date and time, and what company generated that, that content so you actually know whether it was AI generated or manual. And we are logging and archiving all of this. So all of the prompts and responses go into a log so your InfoSec teams have a place that they can go to to identify you know, where the incidents are coming from and what, how to respond. And your auditors have the ability to take a look at the, at, the, at the archive and determine whether or not you're maintaining compliance. And your users have the ability to go through their history and say, I want to go back to that generative AI prompt I submitted yesterday. And you know, I don't remember what the result was, or I want to get that image back. And you can, they can go through their own history and pull back the content that they had previously queried. So all of this is available as a service, and it's something that we are providing as, as, a, as a capability. And so um, with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Kit. Thanks, Jerry. So 45 minutes has gone extremely quickly. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, like I said, the Pubble link there will guide you to the Q&A. We're gonna be doing that online for now. And in uh, 30 minutes, or let's see, an hour, uh, the follow-up session for discussion is online only. However, I'll say in a second where you can find these folks physically. Um, at 1.30, we're doing a discussion, Goldie alluded to it, demonstrating some of these capabilities in more of an applied nature, and also having some time for additional question and answer. So please join us. The session code is there. Um, in addition, uh, you'll be able to find the, uh, the team at booth 301 up on the fifth floor, I think, is that correct? Um, up on the fifth floor and get your questions answered there um, and be able to have sort of a richer discussion about your specific needs. There's all of the contact info here too to find digital footprint of that. And the, uh, the recording of this will be available afterwards as well as for the discussion session later. And some additional detail that Jerry didn't get time to talk through is available on demand. Um, I'll go back to that slide just so you can see. Um, to be able to, to really dive in again on specifics for responsible AI. So be sure to check that out on the Ignite portal. Um, and so with that, we'll wrap here. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you in the next session.